I do want to thank our session sponsor here, introducing the all-new Ream Prestige, an energy-efficient, quiet, and all-electric hybrid heat pump water heater. The future of heating water is finally here. Uh, 50, 65, or 80 gallons, the Ream Prestige can serve many of your different clients' different needs. 3.55 to 3.7 uniform energy factor. In other words, over 300% more energy efficient. Ream stands behind their products with a 10-year warranty, uh, typically a lot quieter than other heat pumps, and there may be utility or federal rebates, tax incentives that can apply uh, to this particular product. One thing we're really excited about is the two different ways this can be installed. In warmer climates with high demand for dehumidification and a lot of unwanted heat, a typical unvented solution is probably best. In colder climates with low humidity from homes that are built right, take the energy right from the outside instead of from the interior. Though in older homes undergoing renovation with moist basements, a non-vented uh, solution still may make sense. Make sure to check with your local HVAC or um, home energy uh, assessor to determine your client's needs. The Reem Prestige helps your clients stay smart with service notifications, potential leak detections, uh, but still with all that, we definitely highly encourage the drip pan uh, to be installed right underneath it if it's in a living space. Make sure to go check it out at reem.com slash hybrid savings. All right, well, welcome everyone to how an eco-concierge can spur action and boost savings from the tough to reach multifamily market. This course is proved for one hour in continuing Ed Lead AP Homes, uh, Certified Green Professional, Nary Green, AIBD, uh, BPI, Non Whole House CEUs, as well as uh, American Institute of Architects Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Uh, today I'll be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I'm the executive director here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Uh, for this one, we're going to be reviewing a pilot program on the concept of an eco-concierge, discuss replication, expansion, and how it ties into uh, some lead requirements and opportunities. All right, so with that, I'm excited to welcome our speaker, Jacqueline. She's a project manager with three years of experience specializing in public relations and outreach, uh, marketing, uh, management of high-performance building projects, utility program development and implementation, and business development initiatives that support Seventh, seventh Wave's mission and program, and, uh, program work. Jacqueline served as the eco-concierge for a behavior change pilot funded by the Illinois Science and Energy Innovation Fund, ISEIF, and she was an in-house resource for multifamily building tenants and facilitated social events and interactive competitions that educated residents on the smart grid and sustainable living. She also assists with the delivery of a commercial building energy efficiency program for ComEd, NICOR Gas, North Shore Gas, and the People's Gas in Illinois. Her outreach efforts have been instrumental in securing more than 35 million square feet of new construction projects, including healthcare, higher education, hospitality, office, warehouse, manufacturing, retail, and multifamily. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a Master of Arts degree um, from, um, uh, I'm going to botch that name, but it's a university in uh, Poland. So with that, uh, Jacqueline, welcome, and please go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Brett. Um, yeah, and just, just for reference there, it's Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, as mentioned, my name is Jacqueline Friedel. I'm a project manager here at Seventh Wave. Um, I also served as the eco-concierge in our eco-concierge pilot. As Brett mentioned, this was a pilot that was funded by the Illinois Science and Energy Innovation Foundation. Our pilot um, went for about 15, 15 months. Uh, initially, we had planned for 12, but uh, we were able to extend it out to 15 months. So today's presentation, I'm going to talk about what exactly an eco-concierge is. I'm going to talk about what uh, we did as an eco-concierge. I'm going to talk about what we have found as a result of our eco-concierge activities in a multifamily building. And I'm going to let you know what you can learn about multifamily tenant behaviors as a result of our experience um, with the Eco Concierge Pilot. 
So the Eco Concierge is a tenant engagement service. I was in a multifamily building for a few hours every month over the course of 15 months. I interacted with residents of the building in a variety of ways, basically looking to engage them in the smart grid as well as sustainable living. I held office hours. I coordinated a variety of sustainability events. I also attended those events. Um, I sent email blasts on a monthly basis with tips on sustainability and smart grid information. So the building that we were located in is called Xavier. It is in Chicago, Illinois. It has 240 units. 24 of those units were dedicated um, for income eligible residents. Those residents uh, did not come into the building until about month um, nine to, to 12 about of our pilot. Uh, we were hoping to be able to work with the low income residents uh, from the start of the pilot, but due to some hiccups at the Chicago Housing Authority, the building owner was not able to fill those units up until later in our pilot. Um, but at least we had a few months where we were able to interact with some of the low income residents. I think it's important to note that this building is LEED Gold certified. Um, so it already had uh, some green features in it. Those included uh, low, low flow shower heads. Uh, they had Energy Star appliances in the units. They had um, some of their, their plants in the lobby, as well as the 18th floor and what you see in this picture over on the pool, um, don't require a lot of water. So the developer, Girding Evelyn, really was trying to embrace um, sustainable living with this building. They are known for being a national leader in sustainable and eco-friendly design. They are um, focused uh, uh, in um, the Portland West Coast area, but now they're looking to kind of penetrate the Midwest and, and East Coast. They embrace something on the right here, uh, you'll see a bookmark. They embrace something called principles of place in all their properties. And again, that's just, just the developer trying to build a green community for the residents. So they were very um, excited to have the Eco Concierge pilot in their building. Their building was already trying to sell the value of green and sustainability. And I think that's, you'll see at the end of the presentation here where I highlight some of our um, data collection and, and data analysis, you'll see that that, that kind of made a difference uh, working in a building that was designed to be energy efficient versus a building that uh, isn't quite at the, the lead gold level. Uh, one last thing to mention here is that this building uh, was not fully occupied when we began the pilot. It was 55% occupied. By the end of the pilot, it was about 93, 95%. Again, there, is, there, there are some uh, <laughs> downsides to that, which I'll highlight later. Of the, the residents in the building, most of them were young professionals looking at the range of 20, 25 to 35 years old. That's not to say there weren't families. There were some couples um, that, were, that were older than that, but for the most part, we were working with young professionals. So the goals of our pilot included educating the tenants on energy use and smart grid technologies. Then we wanted to inspire them. So to take what they knew and inspire them to change their behaviors and really reduce their environmental impact. And then our final piece was to take the education and inspirational piece and drive that engagement with the smart grid technologies that are out there. Um, ComEd has a few uh, energy efficiency programs geared towards um, uh, the residential market and multifamily tenants. So we wanted to drive engagement in, in uh, uh, those programs. So one more thing to, to note here before I really tackle the, the work that we did in the pilot, what exactly is the smart grid? Um, so the way that we, we educated residents on that, we framed it as being, being um, everything related to distribution that has a, a smart component to it. So some type of technological upgrade that makes the the distribution of energy smarter. That includes smart switches, um, smart substations, anything down to the smart meter, which this building did have. And then out of that smart meter, you can connect to uh, smart thermostats and therefore uh, engage with some of those energy efficiency programs through your thermostat and through your meter. Um, this allows for uh, a, a more fluid distribution of energy. So if there is some type of um, 
weather issue or other issue the, the utility can turn the, the, the energy distribution on or off at certain points in the grid. So, moving on. Uh, the engagement strategies that we pursued in this pilot were wide and varied. Um, and the rationale there is that <laughs> we found that, that young professionals are going to be motivated by a variety of things, and not everybody is going to be the same. For the purposes of this pilot, we did find, um, and we didn't know this right away when we, when we tackled our engagement strategy, we found that it was socialness, it was community building, having fun, and really having an ease of access to the information and these events that we were hosting. So I'm going to go through all of these engagement strategies. I'm going to tell you if they were effective or not. So for the first one, we tried a um, gaming platform, a little bit of competition that definitely created buzz in this building. We did this at the beginning of the pilot. So again, we were looking about 55% occupancy in the building, which I think um, kept us from, from reaching our goal in terms of numbers of participants. Um, maybe you've heard of this game, maybe not. It's called Cool Choices. Um, they essentially have action cards that, that you can play every day that are related to sustainable living um, as well as a smart grid. And for each action that you take, you receive a certain amount of points. I um, mean, you'll receive more points for actions that have a higher um, a savings impact or bigger impact on the environment. Our game went for eight weeks. We had teams of six compete against each other. We also recruited property management to participate in this game. And in fact, we also had one uh, maintenance staffer join us. And so they helped us recruit tenants um, uh, to, to the game as well. And, and residents were definitely talking about which property manager they wanted on their team or not. So it definitely had that fun component. So was it successful or not? Well, we had about 22% uh, of all occupied units uh, sign up to participate in the game. We had a 57% participation rate out of that. Um, most noteworthy here was that 14% of the action cards that were played, you see three of them before you, were, were cards that we had customized alongside the property management team and the developer. And those, these, these three cards here supported our one of our goals to engage tenants in the smart grid. So you have 30 points for turning your Nest thermostat to away, 50 points for signing up for one of ComEd's energy efficiency programs, and then we wanted to encourage residents to actually go onto the utilities website and view their electric usage so they could get 50 points um, for that. Outside of the, the, the smart grid, um, cards in this game. We did have a card where we were allowed to collect suggestions from the tenants on what they would maybe like to see in their building or um, what things that, that um, they would like to see from the developer in terms of energy efficiency. And that information uh, was delivered to the property management and developer. Uh, one of the things that came out of that was issues with the Nest thermostat. So the developer then turned over to Nest and asked for some more brochures on how to appropriate, appropriately use a Nest thermostat. So that was kind of cool for, for us to see um, out of this game. Other advice that we got included frustration with um, the shower heads. Um, we had some residents say that they would like to see more recycling uh, and clothing donation options. So the game served, uh, again, a multiple purpose of engaging residents in some of the, the smart grid technologies via the utility, but also uh, pursuing the sustainability goals that the developer and property management wanted to achieve. Email blasts. Do they work or do they not? Well, obviously, email blasts are a great way to communicate with your, with your base. So I sent emails uh, a couple of times every month uh, with sustainability facts. I would, might have event announcements, and you just see snippets of it here in the slide before you. Um, the email blasts definitely created buzz. Certainly, I had residents come to, to my table letting me know that they read the email, and that's why they were at the event. I think probably what surprised me in our, we did an, a, a post pilot survey, what surprised me was that tenants actually asked for more emails. And I think there's always a question when you're, when you are sending emails out, how many is the right amount? And one to two 
per month was our average, and, and I guess that wasn't enough for these residents. Another interesting piece here was that at the beginning of the pilot, we decided to have our property management team send out the email blast through their building link system. So our team would deliver email templates. We would tell them which days we, of the uh, month we would like those emails sent out, and it was up to property management to send those email blasts. We thought that this would be more effective in getting residents to open the emails um, because they're more familiar with their property management team, there's more credibility, they trust them more. It's not like they're receiving a, an email from a third party called the eco concierge and automatically deleted or it goes into the spam or whatever it would be. So that was pretty effective. Issues with that were that sometimes the property managers didn't send the email blast on the days that we wanted, but for the most part, they did a very good job working with our timeline. By the end of the pilot, the property management team um, discussed that actually now that the residents are familiar with the eco-concierge concept, the emails could come from me. Um, and so we didn't quite get to that point where I was sending email blasts regularly, but that was definitely a lesson learned from this pilot that in the beginning you might have to go through property management, but by the end you could be sending those email blasts yourself just because the residents become familiar with who you are. Incentives. So what did we find with this? As it turns out, it doesn't really matter if you're giving away a $15 advanced power strip or a $400 iWatch, an Amazon Alexa, you're going to get about the same amount of residents at each event. The exceptions for this were towards the end of the pilot, which I will get to. Um, but I want to break this down. Let's talk about the prize incentives. So um, we offered a variety of prizes at our events, and I definitely struggled with the issue of inclusivity. So some of the residents already had an Amazon Alexa, an Amazon Echo Dot, whatever it might be, uh, Google Home, and so they were not in, they were not motivated to come to the event based on that incentive. With the low-income residents, um, I definitely raffled off a, um, a smart light bulb. It was a Lift X product, about $150, and um, that was not something that these income uh, eligible residents could use because they don't have a smartphone to be able to control the device. And so uh, they definitely still came to my event, but they, they gave me the feedback that they were not interested in signing up for that raffle uh, because they wouldn't be able to use the, the light anyways. So when you think about incentives, it's just important to note that whatever you're you are using as an incentive, it might not appeal to everybody. And it is going to be very difficult to find an incentive that appeals to everybody. This also translates into food. One of these pictures here, you'll see um, beer and pizza. So some residents are gluten-free um, and they didn't, they just walked by my table saying, oh, I can't eat pizza, um, no thank you. And, and so I missed out on the opportunity to engage with them. What we learned about um, beverages, uh, alcoholic beverages that is, like I said, this building was very um, full of young professionals and we wanted to make sure that there was, uh, they were having fun. It, it didn't quite matter if there were alcoholic beverages or not, but what I did notice is the difference was that when there was beer or wine present, residents would stick around. They might sip their wine, sip their beer while they talk to me, talk to other residents. Um, this is a, a pet-friendly building, so maybe they would um, talk to some pets. And so that was just interesting to see that when it came to food and beverage, it's always great to have something there, um, but it's, it, it didn't really make a huge difference to me with what you offered. If your goal was to uh, get residents to stick around a little more, I would definitely see if you could get some alcoholic beverages. This, um, these incentives didn't always come through our team. We did work with property management to sponsor um, pizza, beverages, that sort of thing. And then the final incentive I wanna address here is having an, an uh, outside party, a special guest, if you will. So we hosted an architectural building tour and we had the building architects come into the building and highlight the components of the building um, that residents might not think about every day. This was great. There were residents that came to this event that I had, hadn't seen at any other event. I also uh, did not see at any other event. Uh, so it was clear to me that they were simply excited by having uh, a special guest and that's why they attended the event. There were some cool questions that came out of that. The residents straight up asked the, the architect, why did you decide to put wood in this hallway? Why did you put, decide to put the fireplace here? So it was pretty cool to see residents interacting with the architect, um, whereas that's not normally an opportunity that they have. 
Uh, finally, I want to highlight one interesting tidbit of the incentives here. Um, our, one of our last events, it was a water conservation challenge event, and we offered a $10 bill, straight up cash, for residents to provide me with a commitment that they would make for saving water. And we very quickly, we had $400, so that would be 40 residents. Uh, we kind of anticipated that, that 40 would probably be, be about the right number. And we went through that 400 very quickly, so quickly, in fact, that the property manager had to run over to the bank and get some more $10 bills. So we had over 40 residents swing by the table to get a $10 bill. We learned that maybe it's, it's um, incentives that are easy to get that are really going to motivate tenants. This was only um, one chance that we had to practice that, but there was another event that kind of had a similar idea in terms of having an easy incentive. We had uh, 40 water bottles designed that had the Xavier logo, and same thing happened. We pretty quickly ran out of our 40 water bottles. Tenants would just swing by as they were going up to their rooms or on their way out and just just grab a water bottle, grab a piece of paper that I had explaining the benefits of saving water and things that they can do to save water, um, and, and that was very effective. So bearing in mind with incentive that, again, and we didn't see a huge difference in um, numbers of our events, but it definitely seemed that when things are easy for the tenants, they're more inclined to, um, uh, to come to that, that event or at least give you two minutes of their time. In-house office hours, do they work, do they not? Well, at the beginning, I would say that definitely did not work. It seemed to be more of a stranger danger issue. Residents were, were afraid to approach the stranger in their lobby. There was one particular event where you see my table posted here. Right next to my table here, there was a, um, and this is actually isn't the photo from that event, but there was a caterer that came in and was um, offering samples of, of meatballs. And by the end of the two and a half hours or three that I was there, and, and this caterer was there, their 30 meatballs were gone, and I only had eight residents stop by my table. So I, I was a little confused. I was right next to um, the caterer. It seemed pretty easy for them to swing by, but I didn't have any granola bars, I didn't have any cookies, no beverages. I didn't have anything to draw in the tenants. I kind of assumed that maybe they would approach me with their recycling questions, with their sustainability questions, but that was not the case. So I learned that there has to be something to draw in the residents. Um, and so you see on the left here, I had a matching game that got residents excited uh, at, a, at another event. Um, I started to offer at least at minimum granola bars and cookies. Interestingly enough, in this building, the granola bars went faster than the cookies. That's just how it goes. Um, but I would recommend that at, at the end of the pilot, what we found is that maybe residents are starting to have more questions about sustainable living and there would be a reason to have an eco-concierge. Also, as the, the program could develop, the eco-concierge could serve other purposes like collecting electronic recyclables, maybe taking those clothes that tenants said they wanted to recycle, um, maybe offering some uh, uh, cleaning products. So there's there's a lot more that the in-house office hours could do, I think, as as um, residents become more familiar with who the eco-concierge is. Sustainability events, do they work or do they not? I'm going to say they absolutely work. They were probably our most effective strategy in uh, working with tenants. But the key here is that you really do need a variety of events uh, just to appeal to the different interests that tenants have. So, for example, on the left here, we have a picture of a utility bill clinic we hosted. So we had... Um, uh, the Citizens Utility Board come in and go through utility bills with residents. We had eight residents really sit down for 25 to 30 minutes with the representatives from the Citizens Utility Board, but we had easily another 30 just, just walk by um, and, and mention you know, certain things that they weren't interested for whatever reason. Some of the reasons that um, they weren't interested that I found um, particularly intriguing was that these residents have a low energy bill. Again, that's a result of an energy efficient building. So their energy bills are about $50 a month, plus or minus. Uh, at least that's um, what, what I had been told. Um, I didn't hear anything higher than the $90. So they told me they weren't motivated to save energy. They didn't want to look at the utility bill for that reason. I had another resident tell me that their dog happens to like the room temperature to be 65 degrees. So they're not, they're not willing to budge on that. That's just how it's going to be. 
Uh, so they were also not motivated to go through their utility bill, learn about it, and learn about the ways they can save energy or even collect money from, the, from, from ComEd for saving energy. Um, so that was pretty interesting there. The middle event was our architectural building tour, uh, just another photo of that. I had two residents come to that event that told me they came to the event simply to meet people. They were new to Chicago, they were new to the building, and they wanted to make friends. So that's why they attended the event, not because they were motivated by um, the architectural building tour. Um, on the right here, we have a cupcake, a sustainable cupcake food truck. Um, I found that some residents don't like sweets. So as I was trying to recruit residents to go out to the food truck, they told me they are not interested in sweets. So automatically I'm missing out on engaging with some residents based on the fact that they don't like sweets. A few residents also were discouraged because of gluten. Um, they have an allergy to gluten um, and needed gluten-free options. This cupcake food truck, turns out they do offer gluten-free uh, uh, cupcakes, so I simply had to let the residents know that that was an option. But there's definitely a disparity there between you know residents who might not be encouraged to do something just because they don't think they're going to like it. And it's up to you to kind of pull their teeth and get them motivated to go. Um, one last thing here, I don't have a picture of this event. We did host a documentary screening, and that was surprising to me. The documentary was about an hour, 20 minutes, and residents hung out for about 45 minutes after the event to talk about the documentary. I kind of expected residents to get up and leave, but nope, they wanted to stick around and they wanted to talk about things. So um, definitely in this building, it, it, was, uh, it was pretty cool to see residents, low income and non-low income alike, sitting together and talking about uh, sustainability and energy efficiency. A little bit more about sustainability events. Other things that we learned is that evenings work best, not mornings, um, not, not the weekend unless maybe it's a Sunday evening. We also found that events were super successful when property management helped us recruit. They know residents by first and last name. They knew the names of residents' dogs and could help us identify who would appreciate this event, who would, who would benefit from it. We had, a, in the middle here, it was a Schmore event. Residents, told, or the property management told one of their uh, uh, residents, he was, he was there with his family, a wife and a kid, that were having a Schmore event, and their kid might enjoy that. And sure enough, they showed up. So property management is definitely helpful in getting folks to come to those events. Also, we learned in our building, interestingly enough, residents, when they would be going up to their bills, or their units after the working day, um, were not as inclined to stop by um, and say hello. They were kind of in a hurry just to get to their apartment. I can totally relate to that. Turns out they had to go grab their dog, come outside, and let their dogs utilize the, the, the bathroom outside. And then on the way back inside, they were a lot more calm and willing to stop by the table. So just paying attention to the characters, uh, the characteristics of your, your tenants is also going to help you frame your sustainability events so that you get the most engagement. Video and social media. So we, we know that um, residents and, and uh, of this building are engaging in a variety of social media platforms. That's natural for everybody. But we had to figure out what it was. Is it Facebook? Is it Snapchat? Is it Instagram? Well, what we found um, here is that it was not Facebook. As you can see on the left here, we have zero likes of our um, Cool Choices game card encouraging residents to recycle and they could get an advanced power strip. Um, we actually learned that it was Snapchat for this building. Um, there is a building Snapchat, so property managers would actually take a Snapchat video or a picture of me letting residents know I'm in the building. And sure enough, I had a couple residents come down and say, hey, I saw this, the building Snapchat and I decided to come down and say hi. Uh, we tried a few things on Instagram. Uh, I was not um, involved in their Instagram, so I didn't really see the activity there. Um, we also did two um, videos. I am going to show you um, just a quick clip of this one here. It was an introductory video, and it definitely um, created buzz with the resident. So I'm just going to show you a quick minute. I apologize, there might be a little bit of a lag, but hopefully you'll at least get the point. I'm Jacqueline, and I'm Xavier's Eco Concierge. What is an Eco Concierge, you might ask? Well, it's like a concierge like Marvin, 
but not really because I'm not here all the time and I don't know the names of all of your pets. An Eco Concierge is your resource for anything smart grid related and sustainable or green. So as your Eco Concierge, what do I do? I do anything and everything to educate you about the things you can do to stop wasting money and energy and live a greener lifestyle. I'm your personal guide to concepts and technologies at Xavier, such as peak time savings, lead certification, hourly pricing, Nest thermostats, electric chromic glass, energy star rated appliances, connected home devices, energy efficiency, paperless billing statements. What? I know, I know, it seems like a lot. I don't want to overwhelm you. We'll take it one step at a time. Each month, you will receive an email from me with lots of information about a particular green topic, like recycling, for starters. So now that you're familiar with what I do, you might wonder when you can find me at the Eco Concierge's desk. I'll be at Xavier the second Wednesday of every month, hosting office hours from 4 until 7 p.m. Ask me about the smart grid, talk to me about recycling, tell me about your day, just talk with me. And oh yes, I might occasionally, sometimes, randomly, hand out prizes. So come visit me, Jacqueline, your Eco Concierge. So that video definitely created um, some buzz. I had residents tell me later that they saw the video and that's how they knew who I was. Um, we only had 400 views on YouTube on that, so I don't really know how many of those were the residents or not, but it definitely generated buzz. And I'm going to show another video, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it first. This was super cool. We did uh, recorded tenant interviews. Um, I sent an email about us looking to recruit um, a goal of like 10 residents um, to do a 10 to 15 minute interview with me about, you know, green things and sustainability and whatnot. Within 24 hours, I had over 40 residents volunteer to participate in the tenant interview. I was shocked. Um, I'm going to, to try to make myself feel a little better and say it wasn't the $40 incentive that motivated them to participate. I really think it had something to do with the fact that I could work with their schedules. It wasn't uh, that I was going to be in the building from uh, on Wednesday from 5 to 7 only. I let the residents know I can come interview, when it's, interview you when it's most convenient for you. So I went to the building um, four or five times and I interviewed 22 residents. Um, and then uh, we have a little clip showing those, those interviews. And I'm gonna show that as well, just a little clip of that. Hi, I'm Jacqueline and I'm Xavier's Eco Concierge. If you haven't noticed, I've been sending you monthly email blasts about sustainable living and the smart grid. I've also been getting to know some of your fellow residents at sustainability events. I recently caught up with a few of them to find out what they know about living green. Come on, let's check it out. Who cares more about sustainability, you or your friends? I think it's equal. Yeah, you know, because you, you know, birds of a feather fly together. Probably me, I'd say. Maybe we're like equal, but <laughs> I'd say probably me. So who cares more about living green, you or your friends? Oh, me, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think our generation a little bit more is caring, but I, for some reason, specifically the water, I seem to be the... That's you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> probably none of us. Um, probably me. Um, just probably a lot to do with my job and the exposure of being working here uh, has sort of opened my eyes a little more to it. When was the last time you recycled something? I recycled a pizza box on Saturday night. <laughs> Very nice pizza. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When was the last time you recycled something? Today, actually, yeah. Oh, very nice, what was it? Bunch of cardboard boxes <laughs> that Amazon shopping gets me every time. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so recycling, what types of things do you typically recycle? Um, lots of junk mail is like the number one <laughs> thing in our recycling thing. Junk mail and cardboard. And cardboard, and shipping, yes. So. Um, also, if we receive anything in any packaging that can be recycled, we recycle that, so like cereal boxes or cheese it boxes. Okay. Beer bottles, a lot of, uh, a lot of 
alcoholic product containers. <laughs> Since everybody in my office is terrible at recycling, I did this today and I went around and picked up all the cans and bottles that were in people's garbage cans because they're just so irresponsible and lazy. Um, so I really try and be proactive about it. I used to work for a paper company and I know they made like a huge effort to recycle, but just like working there, like I can tell like just a lot of things are recycled. I'll tell you one thing I just recently started doing. Um, if I go to a restaurant and do a carry out, they have some pretty nice plastic um, containers. And I just hate seeing just tossing them, so I wash them out. So, like, if I have friends over, maybe for a dinner party or something, they can use those, you know, to carry out food. Or I use the containers depending on the size to put other things in, in them. So, I, I've been using containers a lot. That's been a big thing lately. Recycled all growing up, and then I realized what an impact we had now. So, um, we do a lot of recycling as well. Um, and I even have a little like biodegradable poop bags for my dog, too. Awesome. To <laughs> How much of the world's waste do you think gets recycled? Not a lot. I would say maybe, maybe 20%, but that's a guess. Uh, it's, it's 2%. What do you think about that? <laughs> that's disgusting. <laughs> so it's probably a small, a small number. Oh, would you be surprised if I said it was 2%? I didn't think it was that low. Um, I was thinking maybe 20%, but yeah, 2% is, is terribly low. It's a concerning number. Um, so how much of the world's waste do you think that's recycled? Less than 1%. Wow, that's pretty close. It's 2%. Okay. That was very, does that surprise you? Um, it doesn't really surprise me, but it's scary. It's definitely scary to think about. Um, so how much of the world's waste do you think is recycled? Eight percent. A little less than that. You want to take a guess? Probably about two percent. That's right. It is exactly two percent. I know this actually. I think it's like two percent. It is two percent. How long are your showers typically? Well, you know I'm a bubble bath girl. <laughs> how long are your showers typically? About four minutes. Usually I timed them to a song on the on my playlist. So if it's wow. a three or four minute song, that's what I'm in for. I'd say ten minutes or so, but I do like to do the whole shut up the shower, lather up, and then shower back on type of deal. So usually I'm out of the shower with like in four minutes. And then even brushing teeth, I, I always turn the water off now. Uh, I used to leave it on but now I do. Now you know better. Yeah. Yeah. How much do you think a kilowatt hour costs here? $20? It's quite a bit less than that. Oh, okay. It's like 10 to 13 cents. Okay. Oh, really? I'm starting to be like conservative with my number. Oh my gosh, I don't know. I have no idea. No ballpark idea? No. Okay, so if I told you it was about 10 to 13 cents, would you think I was going to say 10 to $13. <laughs> I'm going to guess 60 cents. A little lower. Yeah, it's like six cents. It's like it's really cool. seven cents for the supply, and then yeah. once you put in all the charges, it's about ten to yeah. thirteen, depending on the time of year. Uh, how much more would you be willing to pay if your energy came from renewables? Um, I would pay more. Double? Um, yeah. Yeah. Triple? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Oh, I could double that. Double it? How about triple? Sure. Because I don't use that much, but maybe not everyone else would agree with that. <laughs> right, true. I'm sure they would. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, how much more would you be willing to pay for solar or renewables in general? Oh, interesting. Um, not much. No, it's just like 15 cents, or, or like up to 15 cents. So, you pay 10 cents now, up to 15 cents. Yeah, I guess I'd have to see how that would affect me like month by month. Um, but. Maybe. I guess it's the sound that I had saying 15 cents. <laughs> if Xavier elected you the next eco concierge, what is the first thing you would do? Oh, probably focus on recycling, get folks to recycle more, um, and just be conscious of the decisions that they're making, try to think about it as part of their, their daily roles. So I think I would want to like analyze all the data of how everybody in the building uses their energy mm -hmm. and figure out like best practices and how we can encourage everyone to apply those across the board. I would start with education. I think educating uh, the people who live here, and Xavier's done a great job of that, I have mm -hmm. to say. Um, but yeah, just uh, educating people so they're more knowledgeable on what energy saving means and what it could do for the future.
All right. Um, so yeah, again, that that the fact that we had over 40 residents volunteer to uh, do the recording recorded interviews really surprised me. Okay. So wrapping up, um, again, this is the list of strategies that we pursue to engage tenants. Um, what really worked and what really didn't, again, it just seems to be that, that you have to have a variety. Um, and unless you design each activity to be very intentional, you're not going to get much out of it. We definitely saw that at the beginning of the pilot. We were kind of playing around with different event ideas, email blasts, that sort of thing. And by the end, it definitely made a difference to have activities that we really thought about and what would make sense for the tenants of that building. Some of these tenants, yeah, are motivated to save money and care about sustainable living. That is why they are in that um, building. Others simply wanted to uh, socialize with other residents. I also learned that some residents are not deterred by having lots of reading. So putting large documents in email blasts didn't discourage certain residents. Um, other residents told me they, they'd rather just socialize over schmores or some beers and talk about uh, maybe a documentary. Others are motivated by being able to click up, pick up a quick water bottle on their way out um, of the building. So email blasts, again, um, we definitely know that tenants responded to emails, and surprisingly to us, tenants wanted more emails. With the gaming, uh, we learned that, yeah, competition is fun, and I'll show you the stat in just a moment here. We learned that over 50% of the residents that completed our post-pilot survey would like to see the game again. That's a pretty big number, and in fact, the game has been implemented at least one more time since the pilot in the building, and it looks like they have another implementation scheduled for next year. With incentives, we know that um, uh, they generate buzz, but do not necessarily increase participation in events. There might be something about having uh, easy incentives, like a $10 bill or a water bottle. Um, In-house office hours, tenants are not going to come to you with their questions, at least at the beginning. They don't know who you are. Um, and, and making sure that you have something that is fun for them to do at, those, at that table is going to be helpful. Uh, sustainability events. Also, um, I didn't mention this, but having sustainability champions. There was one individual, at least at um, a few of our events, that would text or message some of his friends and tell them to come, come on down, socialize, and have some pizza, have a s'more, whatever it might be. Video and social media, it's really going to depend on the audience and historical use. Again, for us, Snapchat seemed to be the most effective. Um, if this building had seniors in it, I think that would look a little different. Same thing if it were mostly families. So those, that's an answer that you can get from uh, property management early on. They probably know what type of social media platforms their residents are using. Maybe they know what they are currently using that is working or not working for that matter, and you can uh, uh, design your strategy based on that. Signage and marking. I didn't um, have a separate slide on this, but we did have a poster made up um, so that every Every sustainability event where I would be present, property management would put the poster up either the day prior or the day of, uh, maybe a couple days prior, letting residents know that I will be in the building and, and at this particular time, and this is um, what the event is going to focus on. Okay. So just a few other things outside, oops, outside of our um, actual strategy, our list of strategies there, we learned that randomness but intentionality work. Um, I did mention intentionality, but what do I mean by randomness? I mean that um, some residents told me that I, I seem to host a lot of events on Wednesdays. That wasn't exactly true, but at least that's how it, how it came off. And they have karate every Wednesday, so they are not able to come to the event just because they already have a conflict on their schedule. So making sure your events are at random times during the week, we learned that about 4.30 to 7.30 p.m. made the most sense, but different days of the week um, outside of Friday and Saturday is, is really the strategy we had to pursue. Also learned um, that um, if property management is already doing a holiday event or a summer kickoff, that's a great place to in, insert some eco-concierge activity. Uh, our property managers were required to have host four sustainability events in the year, so they were able to work with us, the eco-concierge team, 
to fulfill their requirements for the developer. So working with them uh, to be intentional with those events really helps their bottom line as well. Also learn about repetition. This pilot went for 15 months, uh, but I received feedback from residents that they were bummed that they missed out on the game simply because they weren't in the building at the time or uh, they couldn't go to the utility bill clinic because they had uh, karate, but it doesn't mean that they wouldn't have wanted to go. So it's important to work with their schedules um, and kind of be random, but really be at the service uh, uh, that they would need. Oops, uh, I think I skipped on there. More on what works and what doesn't. I keep um, saying this, the relationship with property management is huge. Again, they can recruit residents by first and last name. They can also give you good advice for the area. For example, this property management team suggested that I do not host an event during a home Cub game because, frankly, nobody is going to want to uh, uh, engage with me. They're going to want to be somewhere watching the, uh, the Cubs game. So that was pretty funny. We also learned that, again, property management has the trust already built up with the residents. Um, this isn't always the case for property management teams. I, I've worked with a few now and I recognize that some property management teams are definitely more hands-off. It's also going to be different if you're working in an apartment building versus uh, maybe a condo building, the role that property management would play. So I think that's always something good to tee up if you're looking to design a program like this. Ask the property managers how much they want to be involved and what those expectations would be. Setting that uh, tone at the beginning is definitely going to be helpful. We had issues later in the pilot where property management was understaffed, um, and so emails were not getting sent out on time. We had difficulty collecting the data we needed at the end of the pilot. So again, that relationship with property management, if you can cultivate that from the beginning, set expectations, is really going to help with the delivery of this type of pilot. What else works? I mentioned engaging outside parties, outside of the architects. We brought in that food sustainability, sustainability truck. I also let residents know uh, about uh, food farmers markets in the area, slash where they could find um, the, the bicycles. Uh, I forget what it's called in Chicago at the moment, but you pay a couple dollars or whatever it might be to rent a bike, and it's that bike sharing component. So uh, residents really appreciated that. We also learned that low attendance works. Uh, we were definitely discouraged at the beginning of the pilot where we would only have 10 to 20 residents coming to events. And the developer let us know that, well, when their property management team hosts events, they're also only getting 10 to 20 residents. Residents continually ask for more events, um, but when the events are actually there, they don't attend them. So uh, they let us know not to be discouraged by having only 10 to 20 tenants at each event. By the end of the pilot, it was interesting, um, and I think this has something to do with building that community and taking time. We were interacting with 40 to 50 residents per event um, by the end of the pilot, and that's, that's a huge success in my mind. What else works and what doesn't? Community development. Any type of strategy that, um, that you're going to build needs to focus on, on creating community around green living, especially in this property since the develop, developer was already embracing that in their building design. I learned that when tenants saw others doing something, so they saw a resident stopping at my table, they were more comfortable doing it themselves. Or I know that a few residents would go up to their units and say, well, let me grab my girlfriend, let me grab my boyfriend, let me grab my kid, whatever it would be, and then come down. So they wanted to do it with somebody. Um, again, I'm going to highlight with all of these strategies, the key is uh, to be at the service of the residents, and you're going to have to toy around with timing, with types of events, types of incentives, just because every resident is motivated by something different. This building, by the end of the pilot, when it was 93% occupied, had 363 residents in the building. At the beginning, of course, that was significantly less. But we consistently only had 70 residents going through the building lobby when I was, um, when I was hosting a particular event. So knowing your metric in terms of how, how many people really are going through the building um, to allow you to build this community, um, 
we, again, I interacted with 40 to 50 towards the end of pilot uh, at the events that we hosted. The beginning of the pilot was closer to 10 to 15. If your max number is only 70, is that successful or is that not? Um, in my mind, that, that was successful, but I think it's a little tricky to frame it that way with utilities or developers. They might say, well, if you're only hitting 10 to, to 40 people, that doesn't seem like a lot. But if your max number is 70, that is quite a lot. So again, um, building community is, is huge and not forcing uh, energy efficiency or sustainability on these residents for me was key in this property. Uh, so that wraps up the just the, the engagement strategies that we pursued. I just have a couple slides here. I'm sure some of you are curious on, on our data collection, our data analysis, trying to figure out if our, our pilot was effective in reducing energy consumption um, and supporting some of those goals I mentioned early on in the pilot. So we, we had two ways of analyzing our pilot. We did both a post-pilot survey and um, we had some energy uh, savings data collection that we did. For the post-pilot survey, we had 78 respondents uh, of, of uh, 363, uh, which was 240 units. I think that was a pretty big number. We did offer $25 gift cards, so that might have had something to do with it. But we had um, nearly 80 uh, surveys to sort through, which was just phenomenal. We classified our, our um, uh, survey by residents who had little exposure to the pilot, so pretty much one to three months only, maybe residents that just came to the building, uh, partial exposure, so those that had seven to 12 months of experience, and then full exposure. So those that were um, interacting with me for at least 12 months, if not the full 15. Uh, we had a different population than what we had for our pre-pilot survey. We were hoping to be able to compare our results from the pre-pilot survey to the post-pilot, but since we only had eight repeat respondents, uh, we found that that would be a little bit more of a challenge. And frankly, we just had a lot of new residents in, in the building. I'm going to highlight a little bit more on that survey in, in just two slides here. Energy savings. We wanted to find out if we had residents sign up for Commons Energy Efficiency Program. And they had two that we were specifically targeting. That included the peak time savings and hourly pricing. We also wanted to look at the tenant level um, meter data. So we wanted to see if on a monthly basis, residents were reducing their energy usage. Now, unfortunately, that data is extremely difficult to come by. ComEd does have a package they offer now called the Anonymous Data Service. Uh, and I'll, I'll highlight there, there were quite a handful of challenges um, with, with that data once we got to it. We also wanted to look at the building level consumption. So we worked with property managers to collect um, the, the da data on what the building was using, the aggregate there, and they were able to divvy it up into the common area and residential uh, units. They actually had their building divided by two. So we had uh, the three meters included, one for the common area, one for floors, um, what was it, two through seven or something, and then 11 through 16 was the rest. Um, I forget the, the divvy exactly, but those were the three the three matters, uh, three meters. Um, so I'm going to move to the next slide because I want to cover this stuff. All right. Uh, so results of our sustainable living. This was the post pilot survey. Uh, we learned that residents who had a full exposure to the pilot believed that our eco concierge activities really did support. Um, the, the goals of the building, which included complementing the building's sustainability focus, enhancing their opportunities to be social, um, providing them with useful information. We really liked um, seeing that, obviously. So we know that the eco-concierge did have impacts beyond the energy savings. And this, this certainly is hard to measure. And, and what, you know, what is success, what isn't? Um, we, we know that social interactions were very crucial to the property management team because that can increase tenant satisfaction and retention. So I think for them, having some of this data was, was super valuable. We also learned, I mentioned this earlier, that 50% of all respondents are interested in seeing the Cool Choices game offered again, um, and, and it had been implemented. Level engagement of the pilot also increased depending on the exposure to the pilot. So in that survey, we learned that um, the, the longer the eco-concierge is present, the more willing residents were to engage in the activity. So to us, that meant that we were being random enough with our event scheduling that new um, tenants could also attend those events. 
And then finally, something very interesting here, 27% of that full exposure group reported lowering their water consumption compared to the previous year, whereas 0% of the minimal exposure group reported doing that. In the last four months of the pilot, we conducted three water conservation events, and that seemed to be the impact. So if we remember what I said earlier about repetition um, and having maybe multiple events of the same event to hit different groups, seems to be effective. Also, maybe just focusing, instead of having monthly events, you have quarterly um, events that, that uh, uh, deliver on the same topic. So that would be three months of water conservation, three months of energy savings, uh, whatever it might be. This, this was a huge stat for us to see that 27% reduced uh, their, their water consumption. Results with the smart grid. So we learned that we had six signups for Comet Energy Efficiency Programs. We have three on peak time savings, three on hourly pricing. Um, one question that, that comes to my mind here is, is six too low? Um, if we know that um, 363 residents at least were educated about the program, um, inspired in some way to, to engage, if they didn't engage, are we not successful? So my question is, again, if, if we're letting everybody know about the programs and they're simply choosing not to participate, is that success or not? Um, so I'm, I'm happy with the six that we got, um, but I think, you know, moving forward, it would be, it would be something to think about to say what would, be, what would be successful and what wouldn't be. We also learned that there were higher awareness among tenants with the full pilot exposure about common energy efficiency program. So we know that the longer residents were engaging with the eco-concierge, the more they knew about uh, ComEd's offerings. Meaning of smart meter and smart grid data, this was pretty cool. We asked the residents if um, what, they, what they knew about smart meter and smart grid, if they could define it. And there was a significant increase in responsible uh, responses. So we were excited to see that, in fact, we were being impactful um, through, through the pilot and we were teaching residents about the smart grid. And this is actually going to be the last slide here, uh, talking about our energy savings. Were we able to reduce energy use in this building? And unfortunately, it is extremely unclear for a variety of reasons. We had a lot of difficulty getting the right data. Um, the anonymous data package that was offered was almost too anonymous. So we weren't able to look at a meter, meter uh, data on a daily basis for the course of six months because ComEd would change the account numbers every so often and totally randomly. So we would have data for, for one meter maybe three to six months at a time, but we couldn't get it for 12 to 15. So unfortunately, we, we sorted through that data. It took a lot of time, and, and we weren't able to get what we wanted out of it. I do know that Comet is looking to redesign that, that offering, so maybe moving forward, we would be able to get the data that we needed that was anonymous. Um, the other thing that we, we looked at, we asked the uh, property manager and building developer to send us the, the building um, uh, energy usage, and that, that gave us a little bit more. You see that in the top graph, uh, but again, it's just very noisy. We can't really see um, any major impact on a seasonal basis, on a day-to-day -day basis. The bottom graph here, what we did is we looked at the overall building usage and those lines, the gray lines there, are indicators of when there was an eco-concierge um, engagement strategy. It could have been an email, it could have been an event. Uh, we wanted to see if after events was there a decrease in energy usage. And as you can see, there was, there was not for the most part. I mean, it's really hard to correlate an eco-concierge activity to a little blip uh, reduction in energy consumption there. Um, what this might look like over time would be interesting to see. If, if we looked at this on a yearly basis, that would be curious. It would all be interesting um, if we also weren't when in a new building that was LEED certified. So again, there was kind of minimal opportunity for residents to reduce energy usage. Uh, as I said, their, their energy bills were already pretty low. Maybe they could get it down another five. $10 really would be impressive um, from $50. So um, the energy savings for us was, was kind of a disappointment that we couldn't really use the data that we wanted. Um, 
And moving forward, my suggestion here would be making sure that you have a data collection strategy up front. Oh, we had our ideas of what we could do, and then as we went to do it, we found out that it was very difficult to get that meter level data, very difficult to get um, retroactively building level aggregate data from the property managers. I would encourage anyone who is looking to pursue this type of pilot to ask property management to send you every month the building level data so that at minimum you have that on a monthly basis. Um, and then I would also encourage anyone to try to work with the utility to see what you could get there. Uh, we thought that we could work with tenants to have them sign off on a piece of paper where they would provide us with their utility bills, but that, uh, as we went through, just didn't become realistic. You don't have a lot of time uh, to interact with these residents and to really ask them to provide you with their utility bill data on a monthly basis would definitely be challenging. It might look different in a different property, um, maybe in low income, they would be more willing to share that information. I'm not sure, but in this pilot, that was certainly a struggle for us. So with that, I think that wraps up my portion of this presentation. So thank you. I appreciate any questions you send my way. And as always, you can send me emails after this if you have any more questions about the pilot. Yeah, so um, thanks, Jacqueline. And I wanted to tie this into um, uh, some of the LEED certification requirements and opportunities. Um, you know, clearly this building uh, was certified to the LEED new construction uh, protocol, and so it didn't follow this specific pathway, but it definitely, um, you know, I, I think based on what's in it, it certainly could be a, of use to this program. And so, um, as you can imagine, uh, there's been some slack in the past for lead buildings um, not uh, performing uh, to the level that they should have been designed to perform to. And so, um, one of the ways that's avoided in the lead for homes and lead mid-rise program is effectively having a uh, operations manual designed and implemented both for building managers and for the tenants, uh, kind of like when you buy a new car, it tells you how to operate the car. Um, so in two, LEED 2008, this was under the Awareness and Education section, now under LEED V4 and V4.1, it's housed within the Energy and Atmosphere um, prerequisite uh, section. And so the, uh, the intention of this um, is, again, to provide a maintenance manual for the building managers, for contractors, for homeowners, for tenants, um, so that it's very clear to them on how to maintain uh, an energy efficient, a healthy, uh, water efficient uh, building. Um, and so there's just some basic, the basic requirement is both the manual and just a minimum one hour uh, walkthrough. So we could imagine someone like an eco concierge being able to service that as new tenants coming in. Um, but, uh, but that's just the basic requirement. And so, you know, doing something like this could go obviously above and beyond and keep it as a, uh, ongoing, um, uh, uh ongoing, um, uh, to ensure that those targets are, are hit and maintained for the, uh, for the building. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is, I think, one of the ways, um, that this could, could be, um, accomplished and having an eco concierge, uh, trained to do that. So, you know, Jacqueline, you had mentioned, um, you know, you discussed energy efficiency concept, uh, concepts, water conservation concepts, um, you know, tenants wanted to know a little bit more about where they could recycle, which is a huge part of a lead building, having a, a place to, to be able to do recycling in it. Um, but, uh, you know, what other uh, types of, uh, you know, sustainability uh, are, are things that maybe you discussed or could have discussed, you know, maybe you know, using uh, green cleaners in your apartment or finding access to healthy foods or farmer's markets or being able to use public transportation or, or ride sharing. Was there any of that also discussed or that maybe could have been discussed by the eco concierge? Yeah, uh, so I would say probably, probably half of that we did cover to some degree and there's certainly uh, an opportunity for the eco concierge to talk about those things moving forward. We definitely highlighted uh, transportation uh, uh, things, so letting residents know where they could uh, find a zip car, um, letting them know what types of websites are out there where they could sign up for maybe a different type of a car sharing program. We did let them know where their, um, I think it's called the Divi bike, it slips my mind right now though, where they could, uh, you know, take those bikes. 
We also did highlight the green uh, cleaning supplies. So this property management team did offer green cleaners, but we found that some of the residents didn't actually know how to get their hands on that. So I served that medium where I let them know uh, where they could get the, the green cleaners. Uh, and then of course, how to recycle those bottles when they were complete uh, and using, uh, of using those. We also had a, a lot of questions on the Nest thermostats. And that is something um, I would like to see the eco concierge do move fo moving forward is when a new resident comes to the building, spend 20, 30 minutes with them, letting them know how to best utilize the Nest thermostat um, so that they can, they can save energy or at least they know how they're consuming their energy. Yeah, you bring up a good point. I mean, um, one of the, you know, I ideal requirements is that every time a new resident comes, they have a walkthrough. Seems pretty straightforward, but, you know, incorporating energy efficiency and sustainability into that walkthrough, you know, I I'd imagine some property managers might be good at that. Others might say, is there someone else who can handle that portion? Do you, I mean, so it sounds like maybe an eco-concierge could, could at least handle that portion if they, you know, existed or were retained. Absolutely, and we also learned when I, I did the tenant and uh, the tenant surveys, um, uh, the interviews that is, these residents didn't know that their building was LEED Gold certified. They also didn't know, a handful of them didn't know they had Energy Star appliances, even though there's a sticker on the appliances. So clearly, um, when they're doing their walkthrough, they, they're either not paying attention or property management isn't reinforcing uh, those, those efficient building features. And from the developer's perspective, that's a disappointment. You know, they built a building designed to be energy efficient. Uh, they, they would hope that in the, on the operation side that it's being utilized that way. So the eco concierge can certainly fill that void. Hey, great, thanks. Um, and then before we wrap up here too, you know, a couple other innovation credits that we we came across where we think this could um, fit well is the uh, innovation for community outreach and involvement. And uh, as you can imagine, a large multifamily building really is a self-contained uh, community. And so the concept of this innovation credit is sort of this. Uh, uh, engagement of the community at large during the pre-construction and construction, but then also an ongoing communication uh, between the developer and the community to um, ensure a sustainable building um, is maintained. And so we think maybe someone like an eco-concierge could uh, fulfill that sort of ongoing uh, communication role uh, for this innovation credit um, if somebody wanted to pursue it. Um, and then another interesting credit we came across was an occupant survey um, uh, for, for comfort and how comfortable they are and um, looking at acoustics, uh, cleanliness, indoor air quality, lighting. Um, and so the idea is this survey would be given um, once before the certification occurs and then it would be implemented within the um, building operations to be given again uh, at least every two years to, uh, you know, weed out any issues. And so, you know, I would imagine with all the surveying an eco-concierge um, would do in regards to what Jacqueline presented on, this could be another piece that could be right, added right into it and, um, you know, uh, expand out on um, occupant comfort and, and health. And I guess, Jacqueline, I just would, would, besides like green cleaning or anything, was there any other uh, discussions of uh, indoor air quality or, or health from your side? Um, I think the... Probably not so much on indoor air quality. I know with health, there was at least some questions raised about having maybe a community garden uh, on their uh, uh, on the pool side, so that residents could have access to more healthy foods. Um, we did embrace some of the outside options that they had, so letting them know when and where the farmers markets would take place, letting them know which uh, restaurants in. Chicagoland were certified as, as being green, uh, so, so having less chemicals in their food and whatnot. There was also a component of, I think, as, uh, social activities, maybe fitness around the health side. So what role could the eco-concierge play in, in maybe having yoga or meditation or just some type of exercise class? All of those were addressed. Um, but but probably not too extensively. And again, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say that is definitely a place that the eco concierge could fit in. Great, thanks. Um, well, uh, that pretty much wraps up our presentation. So we definitely got some time uh, for questions. I know I've got some questions. And as those questions are pouring in, 
I just want to say a big thanks to um, all of our uh, volunteers, our uh, board of directors, um, our major sponsors, Mitsubishi Electric, uh, T-Stud, Insulated Wall Studs, and uh, Shrinergy, uh, on-the-go or integrated microgrid battery systems. Big thanks to all of them, and thanks to all of you and uh, Jacqueline, our speaker today, for, for making this happen. So um, I see, uh, let's wait for some, uh, for some questions to, to pour in here. And as they're pouring in, I've got some more, uh, I got a couple on, on my end uh, that, I, that I was wondering about. And, um, you know, I was, I was thinking about the 27% uh, reduction in water that you had mentioned that occupants self-reported um, yeah. was that was that was that verified in any way or was that really just re what people had actually thought had happened? Yeah, that's a good question. So we were able to collect uh, water usage data at the building level. Uh, we had a goal of reducing 15% uh, of that, um, but we had only reached about seven and a half. So, so we, we can't quite say for sure if that 27% correlates with that seven and a half, but we certainly did see a reduction of water at the building level. Awesome, great. Um, and then uh, another question I had was, uh, you know, you, you were mentioning that, uh, you know, occupants may have already had super low utility bills given the fact that the uh, the building was designed you know appropriately from from the beginning um, so I guess I just wonder then um, what other strategies you might uh, have thought of to to help um, encourage reduction I mean was there any thought of like um, being able to uh, more appropriately uh, you know maybe measure everybody's energy use and have it be reported so people could see how others are doing and that might drive or do some kind of energy reduction competition. Or even, I guess, if maybe the building was a zero energy building, let's say in the future, um, maybe if everybody was uh, uh, sort of uh, challenged to make that building hit zero every month, could something like that then maybe spur um, further reductions? Has there been any thought or discussion about those ideas? Yeah, that's a great question. It's kind of funny that you bring up the net zero um, <laughs> idea there. We've mostly focused on the opposite spectrum, so being able to take eco-concierge engagement strategies into a building that's non-efficient, we haven't really thought about it in the opposite way. Um, but I certainly would see the eco-concierge being able to play that support role because I, I, I imagine that a lot of residents that will come into a net zero building or let's say a highly efficient building still don't really know what they could, could be doing to reduce energy. Uh, we found, um, surprisingly, and I think this also ties into that, that 27 reduction in water, residents were almost more interested in conserving water than energy. And I wonder if that's because it was a little more real to them. They could very, very easily see that they turned off the water or they take a, sh a, a shorter shower. Um, so I would definitely pose the question of, you know, if you have a net zero building, um, you know, maybe you have to have a wider strategy that isn't just about energy reduction, but also about reducing the water usage. Yeah, great. Yeah, very important too on, on, on definitely on water usage. So, um, well, hey, that um, looks like we're kind of at time here and that's all the questions we have. So, um, Jacqueline, where can people find out more information uh, about this study and about uh, Seventh Wave? Yeah, so here's my contact information. By all means, feel free to reach out to me. We do have um, a, a website online where we have links to the, the videos that I showed you. If you have questions um, uh, about our post-pilot survey or some of our data analysis, that is pretty much open source, so we can share that with you and, and give you maybe some feedback that, that you would like that I didn't cover um, in, in, in great detail in today's presentation. All right. Well, thanks for your time, Jacqueline. Uh, take care. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.